Welcome to the last lesson of Spirit in the Torah. Next, we'll begin Bereshit, and we'll have it, the kingdom of God in the Torah. But for now, this is the last lesson, uh, and it's Yom Kippur. And indeed, Yom Kippur is not actually the last thing that happens in the Torah, but it's near the end. But the interesting thing is Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, it has to do with always being thinking about that one day we will stand before the Lord in judgment, and He will judge us according to what we've done in our bodies. So it's always a good thing when you think about that to think of revival. And revival in Hebrew is the word shuva, which means to return. And this implies we must have moved away. And just thinking about it, uh, each of us, you know, no matter who you are, it's our inclination. It's the inclination of man to slip, to slide away from the Lord. And uh, so we always need to be thinking about returning. In Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, Yahweh has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says Yahweh of hosts, and I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. Now, I look at it like you may fall ten times in a day, but each time get back up and continue. It's much like a sport. Uh, you know, say football, for example. If a quarterback throws a pass interception, he doesn't go and sit on the sidelines and just quit. He has to go back out and continue. He may throw the very next pass he makes, maybe an interception and a fumble and on and on. But you don't quit. You just keep getting back up. You keep moving forward. You keep returning. So, in saying that, if we are to return, how do we begin? And the, the Bible, of course, gives us many answers. I'm going to give you one from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. And you see, in the days in which we now live, so many people, they sin, they do abominations, and they live in sin, and there is no, they, they, they're no shame. There's no, uh, there's not, they're not ashamed of it to the point where they don't even ha know how to blush, you know. You know, used to, people would blush. Their face was turned red. They would be embarrassed. And, and fewer and fewer that happens to people now because they're just not ashamed of anything. It goes on and says, Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So how do we find the old paths? You know, some people are going to just reject the old paths. Some people are going to reject the ways of the Bible, which is the ways of God. They're going to do it to the very end. You can count on it. The Bible says so. But we who are of His, who are born again, and those who are seeking Him, we want to find that way. We want to find that path. And let me tell you, they are still there. Leviticus 23.1 is a good place to begin to show you some of the very important parts of this path. And it says, And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast, which is the word Moed, 4150 in the Strong's Concordance, of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts, or Moed. Times the feast of the Lord is proclaimed, not just for Israel or for the Jews, but for the Lord. So, in essence, these Moed, which in Leviticus 23, that word feast is mentioned in the King James Bible seven times. And of course, each time it actually means Moed, which is an appointment. And soon, I hope, I have a book that's going to be coming out known as, or titled, Appointments of Messiah. So if the Lord has appointments, if He has 
set times on his calendar, shouldn't we as believers, as followers of his, keep those appointments? And I think the answer is, of course, yes. So here are just seven of those feasts, the most important of those, which first is Passover. And on Passover, Yeshua was crucified. The second festival or appointment is unleavened bread. Now these again, all seven of these festivals or appointments are mentioned in Leviticus 23. So this unleavened bread is the burial. That's when Yeshua was buried. The first fruits is the resurrection. That's of course when Yeshua was resurrected. And because he was the first resurrection, if we believe that his gospel is true, that that he came, that he lived a sinless and perfect life, he kept the word of God perfectly because he was the word of God, that he was crucified, he paid the price for our sins, he was buried on the third day he resurrected. If we believe that, it says in the Bible, if you believe that, then you will be saved. And so we, if you believe, you will one day also be resurrected. The fourth feast is known as Pentecost, or in Hebrew, Shavuot. Now, in Shavuot, the first time was when the Torah came down from Mount Sinai. That's the traditional belief. We know for certain that when Yeshua went back up to heaven in the same year that he went back up to heaven, on the 50th day, on the day of Shavuot, the Holy Spirit came down in power. And we're looking for that to happen more and more as we get close to the time of the next festival, which is trumpets. And on trumpets, the rapture will occur. Now, there is vast differences amongst Christians of when this rapture will take place. Some believe before any tribulation occurs. Some believe in the middle of the tribulation. And some believe when the tribulation's over. I'm not going to give you my viewpoint because that's not the point of this lesson. The point is that it's going to happen. The trumpets will sound and the dead in Christ will rise and those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The sixth day, or the sixth feast rather, is Yom Kippur, which is what we're talking about now. It's the day of atonement. And what will happen in the future, and I believe the very near future, after we return to the Lord, there will be the Bema judgment seat. So again, that's when we will be judged according to what we've done in our bodies. Not for sin, but indeed perhaps for, um, you know, we're not going to be judged as far as punishment, but maybe we will be reminded of opportunities we missed. But greater than that, we'll be given the rewards for the good things that we've done for the kingdom of God. Then finally, there is the Feast of Tabernacles. Your Bible may say Feast of Booths, which actually it's the Feast of Sukkot. And it's, of course, uh, when they were in the wilderness, it was the 40 years that God was with them. His presence was with them in the wilderness. And so this reminds us that He is going to come back and He is going to live with us physically Yeshua, Jesus, is going to come to this earth and rule and reign from Jerusalem and live with us forever. It's a beautiful and wonderful thought. And it's not just a thought. It's an actual fact that that's going to happen. Now, in Daniel 7.25, it says that Satan changes these appointments. Now, what an awful thing to think about, uh, that Satan would actually come along and change these appointments. Well, think about it. How many do you know, perhaps even yourself, that go to church and none of these seven feasts I mentioned to you are ever talked about and certainly are never actually celebrated or remembered? And indeed, like I said, the Bible never says they're just for the Jews or for the Israel. The Bible says they, these are my feasts. Seven times the Lord says, these are my feasts, says Yahweh. So they're his feasts, they're his appointments, they're his set times. So certainly all who follow him and believe him as their heavenly father should be keeping his appointments, wouldn't you think? But like I said, it says in Daniel that Satan 
set out to change these feasts. And we're going to also see this mentioned in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? And here's how he did it. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. Now in this instant, the, the word congregation we read here, if you look in your Strong's Concordance, it's again interesting, very interesting, the word again, Moed, 4150 in your Strong's Concordance. And of course, what is that? It's appointments. So right here, it's saying that Satan has set out, and that's why he was thrown out of heaven. Because he has said he will exalt himself above God, above the throne of God, and he would change God's appointments. So in essence, Satan was saying he would have his own appointments for people to follow. He would replace the set times of the Lord. And indeed, that's where we've been for the last almost 2,000 years. It wasn't long at all after Yeshua returned to heaven that the feast of the Lord began to be changed. Uh, and I won't go into all the reasons for that. You can look it up and, and, and for yourself. Do your own study. But for, just, for, uh, just for now, just to say that that's what's happened. You can see that's what's happened. Isaiah fourteen fifteen. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So God says, even though you've done this and you succeeded for a while, you're going to be brought down to the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shut kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? So all of us who are born again believers in Yeshua will one day view this sight. We will be flabbergasted that this was the being, the Satan, that was did so much harm. And we'll be amazed because we'll see he is really not that much at all. But we allow him to be much. We allow, uh, we, we, we allow him to, this fabrication that he does to, uh, to grow in our hearts and minds. Now, I would like to greet you with Gamar Hatama Tova, meaning I hope your name is sealed in the book of life. Now, this is the greeting given at Yom Kippur. And as I'm reading this to you, it's not Yom Kippur. It's been a few weeks ago. But it's always a good thing to remind yourself, is your name written in the book of life? And as you read this now, at, and think about Yom Kippur, and the fact that one day you, my friend, just as I, will be judged. We will be an individual standing before the Lord, and He will judge us. Praise our Yahweh. I'm so glad we have a Heavenly Father, Abba, and a heavenly king, Yahweh, Aveno Malkanu, our father, our king. As our king, we have broken his laws. As father, we have broken our relationship with him. At Yom Kippur, this is what happens. This is how God pictures in Yom Kippur, and he did it through the blood and the life of Yeshua, but he pictures this, he foreshadows what Yeshua would do hundreds of years later when Yeshua came to, to the cross, but he, he foreshadows this at Yom Kippur with two identical goats, which were chosen, one for the Lord, our king, and the other known as the Azazel, our scapegoat. The goat for the Lord was killed, and the blood was sprinkled eight times on the mercy seat. So the priest would go in with the blood and smear it on the mercy seat, which was the covering of the ark of the testimony, which was in the holy of holy places. And the rest of the blood was smeared on the incense altar, representative of our prayers. And this goat represents our sin and is killed because the wages of sin is death. This is God's idea. This is God's economy. God is the one who has said this as recorded in Romans 6.23, that because of sin, we deserve spiritually to die. And this sacrifice that was given on Yom Kippur would only pay the debt forward. 
until the next Yom Kippur. So it was a temporary offering of sin until the final offering would be given through the blood of Yeshua. The Azazel, or scapegoat, would have the high priest place his hands on its head of the goat and pronounce all the sins of Israel. It was then led to the edge of a cliff overlooking the Hinnon Valley, which in those ancient days smoldered as the lake of fire. The Azazel is the payment for the broken relationship which ends in a lake of fire. Also, it's the place, if you think about all of our sin, which is as trash and garbage, and that's exactly what would happen. The, the people's trash would be taken and dropped over and burned in this, this ongoing lake of fire. Because you see, in those days, the sea of the Dead Sea came very close to the edges of Jerusalem, and it was so much more um, uh, chemical. I, I can't explain, but it, it was more. It would it would actually have uh, spontaneous combustions right in the lake, and so it truly was like a lake of fire. So Israel Israel carried out these sacrifices for around fifteen hundred years. Now imagine that. These ceremonies and these appointments were kept by Israel for 1,500 years, over 1,500 years. But then the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, 70 AD, the most holy place, the place sins could be atoned for. The king's word is clear. The father's word is clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no blood, no forgiveness. Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. In the New Covenant, the Brit Hadashah, we see this in 9.23 of Hebrews. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So because the temple was destroyed and they could no longer carry out these sacrifices, what did Israel do? What could they do? Several rabbis, led by Rabbi Jonathan ben Zakiah, convened in Yavni in southern Israel. In their minds, they made a way to atone for sins. It would be through Teshiva, good deeds. Remember the words of the king and the father in heaven. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, no forgiveness, no mercy. So you can't change the Torah. You, it, it's it's stone. It was written in stone, remember? And it's God's Word. You cannot change God's Word. And God doesn't change His Word. So keep that in mind. For many other things, God's Word never changed. It's steadfast. But the Jews just got religion. Just like many of you here, many of you that are maybe listening to this now, you feel religious and you once made a claim to know Yeshua or Jesus but actually, you just made a fake appeasement of religion. Your religion cannot save you. Only the blood of Yeshua applied by faith to your heart will save you. Yeshua Jesus is that sacrifice foreshadowed by the goat offered to the Father for our sins on Yom Kippur. His blood was offered and, sac- and sa- satisfied excuse me, the requirements of the king's law demands. He was the Azazel, the scapegoat who allowed his own relationship to be severed from the Father. He made the way for us, for you to come back. The word repentance in Hebrew, remember, is teshiva, and it means simply return. You right now can say to your heavenly Father, I trust what Yeshua did by being the once and for all sacrifice for my sins. I receive what he did. Now I receive it. I thank you, heavenly Father, that Yeshua was the final scapegoat and restores my relationship to you. Thank you, Abba, in Yeshua's name. The decision is now before you, you to choose. Do you choose to Shiva, return to the Father? I pray that you do.